Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Talk with Mott web chat. Our topic today is heart failure and heart transplant, and we're so pleased you all are spending this time with us this afternoon. We've got a great panel today, but before we get started, we're going to take care of just a few housekeeping items. Today's chat will begin with a short presentation, and then we will open up the floor to Q&A with our panelists. But you can start submitting your questions anytime. You can either submit them via Twitter by using the hashtag MottChat, which you can see in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, or you can send us your questions by email, and the email address is mottchildren at umich.edu. That's mottchildren at umich.edu. At the conclusion of our web chat today, we will be sharing a link to complete a very short survey to let us know if the chat was helpful to you. And if you have any recommendations for topics for future web chats, we would love to hear those. Um, also, any other recommendations you have on things that would make the chat work better for you, we thank you in advance for any of your feedback. This chat is being recorded today and will be available immediately after the chat on our YouTube channel. Um, please feel free to forward that or share it with any friends who weren't able to join us today. Um, and you can get the link to the chat directly from our webpage, www.mottchildren.org slash webchats. We'll also be sharing that over our Facebook and Twitter pages. With that, let's go ahead and meet our panel today. Dr. Kurt Schumacher is a pediatric cardiologist who specializes in heart failure and heart transplant in children. And Meg Zamberlin is a nurse practitioner with our pediatric heart transplant program, both here at the University of Michigan CS Mott Children's Hospital. So why don't we start out with Dr. Schumacher, who's going to start us off with a brief background on heart failure. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I uh, wanted to first just talk about heart failure and, and what it is so that we're all on the same page and understanding it. Um, the heart is actually a pretty simple organ. It has really two jobs. It fills up with blood and then it pumps that blood back out to the lung or the body. Um, the complex part is when the heart starts to fail because there's a lot of different ways where it can do it. But failing basically just means the heart is either not pumping effectively out to the body or it's not filling up with blood effectively. And all the different things that cause heart failure cause one of these two things or both of those things to happen. Um, each failing pump, each failing heart causes heart failure. And when we say heart failure, what we mean is actually it's just a collection of symptoms that patients experience and patients tell us about based on the fact that their heart is not working effectively and it's not doing its job. Um, patients can feel many different things. Sometimes they feel uh, tired. They can't walk as far as they used to without getting too tired and needing to take breaks. They can feel out of breath when they do exercise. They can feel out of breath at rest. They can report being swollen in their legs uh, or in their belly or even in their face. Uh, there's a lot of different symptoms and they're not all specific to heart failure. But it's our job as heart failure specialists to be able to recognize these symptoms and consider the fact that it may be the heart that's contributing to it. Um, so as heart failure specialists, we have specialized training in how to recognize and treat heart failure. Um, when we see a patient, and a lot of the patients are referred to us and we've never met them before, um, we do a really thorough evaluation to try and understand why the heart is failing because when we really understand why it's failing, uh, we can then tailor our therapy best to try and make it recover. So we, when we see a new patient, take a long history, do a really detailed physical about what's been going on uh, with them, what have they been feeling and what their medical history is, but we also do a lot of different tests. We get a lot of blood labs. We can get an uh, EKG or other types of heart rhythm monitoring. We get chest x-rays. We get echoes to understand how the heart is functioning. We can do uh, exercise testing. We can get cardiac MRIs or CTs, a lot of different ways to understand exactly how the heart is working. We also often get a cardiac catheterization because these allow us to actually measure pressures as blood is flowing through the heart, and it allows us to tell a lot in a lot more detail exactly how the heart is or is not effectively doing its job. Um, all of this, again, is done so that we can tailor our therapy the best possible way to our patients because our therapy is very widely, uh, but the goal of every therapy is pretty much the same. We want the symptoms to go away, and then we want the heart to be able to recover as best as it can. So the first thing we do is usually start patients on oral regimens of medications, things they can take by mouth. And with these oral regimens, a lot of times we can get symptoms to go away, either temporarily or permanently. Um, and with some of these, we can really give the heart time and the things that it needs to recover so that where it was failing before, now those things are getting better. Um, 
and we've been very successful with some of these therapies. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes oral medications are just not enough to get a heart to recover. And despite our best efforts with things that people can take at home, uh, we can't always make a heart recover. And when that happens, we have to start turning to more sort of invasive types of therapies. One thing we often do in our program is start people on continuous IV medications. So um, medicines that are designed to help the heart squeeze more. And most of the medicines that can do these things are just uh, need to be given continuously through a pump. So there needs to be an IV in permanently uh, and patients essentially need to carry a pump around with them at all time continuously infusing these medications. And these can be really effective at reversing symptoms, but this isn't a long-term solution. So one of the other things we also think about frequently are ventricular assist devices or VADs. Um, VADs are artificial heart assist devices. They are machines essentially that we insert into the heart, and there's a number of different ways these machines work, there's a number of different types of machines, but they all do the same thing. They all help fill up with blood and pump blood out to the body and assist the heart as much as they can. Uh, these technologies are getting better and better and better, and we've been using them more and more, uh, but they're also not permanent solutions at all. So in those cases where we get somebody who has to be on an IV medication or who is on one of these devices, we also have to start considering the option of heart transplantation. Um, heart transplant is really the ultimate therapy for, um, for end-stage heart failure, for heart failure that we can't make it go away any other way. Um, we our heart failure practitioners because we think heart failure is an effective and a good treatment for these things, but we want to stress that it's not, heart transplantation is not a cure for heart failure. It essentially is a trade-off where we trade heart failure mm -hmm. away and the symptoms that go with it for a new set of medical problems that go along with heart transplantation. We just happen to think that these medical problems are a better set of problems than the patient was experiencing when they had a heart failure. Mm -hmm. um, the evaluation for a heart transplant can be really rigorous, and I'm going to let Meg tell you more about why it's so rigorous and what exactly we do. Thanks. So like Dr. Schumacher said, um, heart transplantation is definitely trading one set of issues for another set of issues, and we um, firmly believe that with heart transplantation, it's um, a better um, easier set of issues. Um, one of the reasons why we do heart transplantation is for quality of life, and we take that very seriously. Um, these kids um, feel pretty bad with their heart failure. The families, um, there's a lot of work that goes into taking care of kids with heart failure. There's also a lot of work that goes into taking care of a child with a heart transplant. So when we are doing these heart transplantation evaluations, we think of three families when um, we're doing these things. And we think of the donor families, and those are the families who are making the ultimate decision when one of their loved ones pass away or die. Um, we t are also thinking of the recipient families and making sure that um, the recipient families are well taken care of and have the information that they need to be able to take good care of someone with a heart transplant. And then we're also thinking of the families who are waiting for heart transplantation who will not get a heart. These donor organs are very scarce. Um, there are a significant number of families who and children who will not receive an organ um, before it's too late. So that is um, a large reason as to why these heart transplant evaluations are so extensive. Um, like Dr. Schumacher said, we look at every organ system um, of the recipient, um, potential recipient. We do an extensive social work evaluation. There's a psychological evaluation to ensure that the families um, and the children have all the support um, that they need throughout this process. Um, we do a financial evaluation to ensure that the families have the financial means to take care of these organs. Um, and we do take that all very seriously. The heart transplant evaluation is not something that um, takes a short period of time. And we know and we appreciate that when we're doing these evaluations, it's when your children are very, very sick. Um, 
but that is all part of the process um, to ensure that the recipient and their families can take very good care of these organs and we know how to give them the tools and the information that they need to do that. So uh, when we do this evaluation, we get through it, we want to make sure that everybody understands exactly what you're getting into with heart transplantation. Mm -hmm. um, there's a number of things after heart transplantation that people have to be aware of. I'm sure many people who are listening have heard about rejection. Rejection is when uh, somebody, when your own immune system, if you've had a heart transplant, recognizes that heart is not being a part of you and tries to get rid of it. Your immune system is essentially doing what it was designed to do, to eliminate foreign things in your body. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it tries to get rid of the only heart you have, that is a problem. So we have to be on medications basically for the rest of uh, the person who gets a heart transplant needs to be on medications for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. um, these medications are not without side effects. We have to be always watchful of those. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a number of other complications that can happen after heart transplant. But the expectation is that for many, many years after heart transplantation, these complications will not be a big impact on a person's life mm -hmm. and that people will live a really high quality of life. Mm -hmm. And in fact, some research that's been done in our center has been uh, in collaboration with other centers that actually Meg has been a big part of, mm -hmm. has looked at quality of life after heart transplantation. And we know that it's really good for pediatric patients. They report it being really excellent. Um, and we at our center really strive not to restrict people after heart transplant to the best of our ability. Um, potentially more, actually I know more than some other centers do, but we really want people to live life to the fullest after heart transplantation because that's why we do this. Um, and our children have had good success with that too. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't do anything that we thought was causing somebody to be sick or at increased risk. Right. But right. we are happy when kids get to play sports or when kids get to go on roller coasters mm -hmm. or climb mountains. Mm -hmm. And those are all things that if that's what they want to do in our life, that's what we want people to be able to do. Mm -hmm. And heart transplantation allows somebody who had a heart that would never been able to do those things or experience those things mm -hmm. to now experience them. And that's really why we do this. It truly is a second chance. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so that's heart transplantation, and I'm, I'm sure we're going to get a lot more questions about it. I wanted to touch really quickly on some of the research that we're doing around heart failure and heart transplantation in Michigan, um, because we have a very active research program, and all of our research is geared at trying to get patients to do better during their heart failure period and then uh, after their heart transplantation. Um, Dr. C, who was supposed to join us today as one of our cardiothoracic surgeons, actually has a lab that's very active in looking at stem cell research in terms of uh, allowing hearts that have been injured to regain function and be better. And, and his research, along with many other people in similar veins, is really actually exciting in terms of, of thinking about heart failure for the future. Um, Otherwise, we are involved in a number of heart failure projects. Our center is a collaborator in a brand new heart failure registry, an international heart failure registry, where we're going to, this will be the first of its kind, where we're actually going to pool all pediatric patients with heart failure from many, many different centers so that we can learn something about pediatric heart failure that we have weren't able to learn before using all of our collective experience. Um, we are also involved in a number of uh, projects looking into ventricular assist devices or VADs. Um, there is a study called PDMAX, which is our VAD registry. So every patient who goes, every pediatric patient who gets a VAD put in goes into a large database. So again, we can collectively learn about uh, how the VAD worked, what complications they had, and what things can we learn from each other. Um, we are part of an NIH-sponsored trial, actually a core site for an, for an NIH-sponsored trial looking for to develop new pediatric VADs that we hope sometime in the future we'll be able to launch. Uh, that's called the pumpkin trial. Mm -hmm. um, and we have multiple other studies looking at different types of heart failure. In particular, we're interested, um, or at least I'm interested in some of my collaborators in Michigan are interested in, um, in people who have had congenital heart disease, structural heart disease that they were born with that's been operated on and then fails, um, uh, particularly single ventricle patients who have had something called a Fontan palliation. Mm -hmm. There's a number of ways that Fontans can fail even more than, than people who had structurally normal hearts. Uh, and we have a number of research uh, projects currently looking at the different ways a Fontan can fail and how we can learn how that happens so that hopefully someday we can prevent it. Um, from a transplant perspective, we're also very, very active 
in terms of trying to understand all of the factors that cause patients to not do as well after heart transplantation. Um, we have recent projects into looking at the different risk factors that someone who's listed for heart transplant could have so that we can understand exactly what their risk of surviving or not surviving at transplantation is. Um, we've also really in depth looked at a number of other factors that we think can cause patients to not do as well after heart transplant so that we could potentially identify modifiable things, things we can do before the transplant that makes that patient a better candidate. Um, we have done lots of investigation into people with Fontan or other congenital heart disease who go through transplant in terms of understanding how they respond to transplant and the different issues and unique issues that they may have. Um, we have done extensive research into helping people's immune system get ready or changing their immune system or taking away parts of their immune system that may cause rejection so that we can get hearts to be more tolerated once we transplant them. And all of these things are being done to make our patients live better and longer without complications. That's what we, that's what we strive for. Okay, well, I think we'll go ahead and open up the floor to Q&A then. Um, and just as a reminder, you can submit your questions anytime um, by Twitter using the hashtag MottChat or by email. You can email us at MottChildren at umich.edu. That's M-O-T-T -T, children at U-M-I-C-H dot E-D-U. We'll go ahead and start from some of the questions that have come in already. Um, First question, how long will a pediatric transplanted heart last? You want to take that one? Sure. Uh, the answer is really, it, it depends. Um, there's a number of different factors that go into how long a heart's going to last. The If you made me give one answer, we'd say on average 15 years. Um, yeah, that's just an average. Some will last shorter. Some will last much longer. One of our first transplant patients ever at Michigan is still on his first heart and seems to be doing fine, but he's 20, 25, 25 or 26 years out, years out mm -hmm. uh, and is still doing just fine. Um, but then number 15 is very, very um, nonspecific. So infants we know who are transplanted who survive through the first year, we actually don't know how long their hearts are gonna survive, but it's something probably greater than 20 years. We just, there are not enough of them who have died for us to actually know what the average survival will be. So that survival is much better. Um, average adult survival may be a little bit less than 15 years, and adolescent patients seem to be more similar to adults than they are to pediatric patients. So that 15 years may be a little bit less for some of the older pediatric patients that we deal with. Um, but there's a number of other factors that go into it, so there's not one really good answer to how long it's going to last. And it's interesting, too, because when pediatric heart transplantation started, it was in 1984, and people were not quoted a lifespan at that point, and mm -hmm. then it got to be to five years. And when I first started in pediatric heart transplantation about 12, 13 years ago, we were telling people around 12 to 15 years, and now we're telling people 15 to 20 years. So there has been progress in this field um, in a mm -hmm. pretty short amount of time. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question we received. Um, how many heart transplants can one get in a lifetime? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, right now, most of the time people have one and then they're eligible for a second transplant. Um, there have been a relatively small number of people um, who have received third heart transplants. Um, and so after that, I think we need to continue perfecting what we're doing. Yeah. Um, the, I mean, the standard answer we give is two. And oftentimes mm -hmm. by the time you've gone through two heart transplants, there's a number of other medical issues that make you potentially not a great candidate for a third. But there mm -hmm. are definitely patients who we have been involved with listing for third transplants mm -hmm. or helping evaluate. Uh, and Dr. Friedland Little, who's one of my partners at Michigan, actually researched this question using a national database. Mm -hmm. And there have been probably about 50 patients in the United States who have had a third heart transplant. Those patients definitely look like they have been selected and are a relatively healthy group of patients who need a third transplant, mm -hmm. as, as much as that may not make sense. But all of their other organs seem like they're doing fine. It's just, once again, their heart was failing. 
Um, and those patients appear to do just as well as the patients who had a second transplant. Um, so we think that potentially you could go on getting heart transplants indefinitely as long as there's no contraindication. It's just the risk of, of having a contraindication to transplant probably gets higher the further and further you get out. And that leads me to talk about pediatric heart transplantation and how, you know, children who are in need of heart transplants, unfortunately, do not have the expected lifespan. And so we take that very seriously. And part of how we do take that seriously is by following the children very closely, mm -hmm. watching their kidneys because the anti-rejection medications that they need to be on can be very, um, can be harmful to kidneys over long periods of time. So we try and run the kids um, with the least amount of immunosuppression um, that they need. However, the balance between rejection um, and infection is a tight balance. So there is a lot of follow-up that we do after the transplantation. However, our goal is to protect the kidneys and the liver and all the other organ systems as best we can over the lifespan so they are eligible for future transplants when they're needed. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, the next question. Where are we at with finding new or better options for a heart transplant? Need to go again? Sure. Okay. Um, I don't know exactly what you mean by new or better options, but I, I think I've got at least a few ideas. So um, you, I think you're saying alternatives to heart transplant. So I, I think there's a couple of things that you can look at. One is there's always been a really interest in growing artificial hearts, mm -hmm. sort of bio hearts. We're many, many years away from that being a reality. There's certainly research in going into that um, and people who are engineering hearts on frames that could actually be functional, but those are nowhere near uh, being ready for clinical use in real patients. Mm -hmm. Um, something much closer, however, probably is are the ventricular assist devices like we're talking about. Um, there are currently ventricular assist devices that we have actually used called total artificial hearts, which essentially you take that person's heart out and put in a completely artificial device that does the work of the heart. Um, right now, these devices are not lifelong technologies, but the, the technology involved in ventricular assist devices has been advancing so rapidly that I can certainly imagine a day when we can, instead of having to do a heart transplant, actually just replace a heart with a artificial or a robotic heart, something that will do the work for it. Um, and that, that is certainly possible. Mm -hmm. Right now, those devices cannot guarantee a lifespan as long as transplant can. And when they're going to overtake, or if they will overtake, the, the life that can be uh, offered by a heart transplant is unclear, but it's certainly possible they will sometime. <clears throat> Very fascinating research underway, certainly mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of hope out there. So, mm -hmm. um, Okay, question that came in over Twitter, what impacts the risk of rejection after transplant for a patient? I would say um, one of, one large impact is medications and the ability to be able to take those medications. And this is one piece of the evaluation that we had referenced before, um, these medications work on a daily basis and a long-term basis, and they need to be taken consistently over time. Um, so that is one of the impacts of rejection post-transplant. The medications don't necessarily guarantee that one will never reject. However, it is one of, uh, it's probably the most important precaution that you can take to maintain the least amount of rejection possible. There's also other factors that I think Dr. Schumacher can reference more, or explain sure. better, is like antibodies and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I completely agree with Meg. The number one thing that influences rejection is whether people take their medicines. Mm -hmm. um, the, not taking your medicine is the biggest risk factor of all risk factors for, for rejection. So that's, mm -hmm. that's certainly number one. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of other things that we, we could probably talk for a whole hour about different things that influence rejection. Um, but one of the main ones is our ability to balance your immune system with our medications. Mm -hmm. um, even if you are taking your medications, we have to get into a pretty tight range between completely annihilating someone's immune system so that, that they will never reject, but also they're prone to a lot of infections. Lots of infections. Um, 
and allowing enough immune system that they will be able to fight infections, but they can't quite ramp up a, a full-blown rejection episode. So we have a number of different medications, and sometimes finding the precise place that a patient needs to be in um, to avoid having rejection and keep their immune system at the right place can be challenging, although we've had a lot of experience with it, and it can be good. The other thing um, that causes or influences rejection are something called antibodies. Antibodies are a part of your immune system, just one piece of your immune system. Um, but these are sort of tags that float around in your blood and, and recognize something as being not you. And once you start making antibodies to the heart, your body will keep making antibodies. You have cells that produce copies of the same thing. Um, and what antibodies do will say, oh, they'll recognize a, a protein on your heart, something on your heart, and say, this is not supposed to be there. And they latch onto it and they essentially tag it, send up a flag for the rest of the immune system to recognize and say, this is not supposed to be here. Come here and get rid of it. They sound the alarm to the rest of the immune system. Um, once you're making these antibodies, uh, it can be very difficult to make them go away. And even if you treat one episode of rejection, if you still have antibodies against the heart that are floating around in the body, um, it could happen right away again. So it's, it's a, uh, one of the things we've certainly been thinking about more and more and more in the field uh, over the last several years is antibody rejection, and we are going to continue to to work on on making our therapy for this as good as possible and as efficacious as possible. But certainly, whether or not you make these antibodies to your heart is one of the big risk factors for rejection. What about um, the risk of coronary artery disease? We had a question come in about whether certain transplant patients are at higher risk of developing coronary artery disease. Coronary artery disease um, in a transplant recipient, heart transplant recipient, is something that if nothing else happens, will eventually happen. At least that's the state of the science at this point in time. There's a lot of research going on that is targeting transplant coronary artery disease specifically because that seems to be the number one culprit for needing a second transplant. There are certain factors that do affect when someone starts developing transplant coronary artery disease. Um, one of those risk factors is um, episodes of rejection. Mm -hmm. um, that's taxing to the heart and the therapies that are necessary to treat that rejection can also affect those transplant coronary arteries. Um, and then medications, we think, and transplant coronary artery disease is not really well understood. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, sure. Um, transplant coronary disease, we certainly learned more and more about mm -hmm. recently, but exactly what causes the coronary arteries and transplant patients to get sick is unclear. It's certainly different than atherosclerotic coronary artery disease or the, the coronary artery disease we hear about most often in older adults or you know with high cholesterol and high blood pressure. Um, this is different. Those, those atherosclerotic disease obstructs or blocks sort of the big coronaries. And the coronaries are the blood vessels that actually feed the heart muscle itself so it can work. And when those get blocked, the heart muscle doesn't have blood and it stops working. That's a heart attack. Um, atherosclerotic disease affects the big vessels. Uh, coronary transplant coronary disease actually affects the smaller vessels sort of way out in the branches as the, as the coronaries feed into the heart muscle itself. And it affects many, many at the same time. It certainly has some immune system mediation. Um, it's different than rejection the way we've talked about it so far. but modulating the immune system certainly goes into it. Um, we know there are risk factors, like Meg said, previous episodes of rejection, length of time since transplant. Um, there are taking hearts from older donors um, into young pediatric patients increases the risk of, of coronary artery disease onset. Um, and a number of other sort of health and lifestyle factors actually play a role as well. Um, we have made some progress, and there are some medicines that have come out online in the last few years that seem like they slow the onset of coronary artery disease in transplant patients. We are certainly using those aggressively in our center now mm -hmm. um, in terms of starting them before we see any evidence of coronary artery disease. Mm -hmm. um, but how well they're going to work in pediatric patients is, remains a question for the future. Okay, we have another question that came in um, on our Twitter account. Are there improvements on the way for determining rejection other than routine biopsies and CATs? 
Yes. <laughs> there are. Um, so this question actually hits on a pretty controversial topic within heart transplant and pediatrics especially mm -hmm. itself. Um, there are really two different camps in the field on this and we don't know which group is right. Um, there are people who believe that screening biopsies need to be done repeatedly because rejection can happen without any knowledge of it. Um, so there are, there are transplant centers and transplant groups who will biopsy uh, every several months for the rest of a patient's life to look for rejection, look for evidence of that. Um, we are a little bit different. We biopsy a lot less than many centers in terms of looking for rejection. Um, we certainly still biopsy more than some transplant centers, but, but we on the continuum of how many biopsies you get, we tend to stay on the less biopsies are better side of things because we have, we very rarely, when we looked at our own information on our own history of doing this, we very rarely saw a or rejection that needed to be treated in patients who didn't have any symptoms. Um, so our center practice is if you've had a long period of not rejection immediately after transplant, um, we will do biopsies for a while after transplant, but if you don't have any evidence of rejection, we'll wait and see if you have any symptoms or if anything else happens. Uh, there are a number of technologies that, have, yeah. that are coming online to look for rejection otherwise. Um, there are uh, different blood tests that have promise in being able to see different proteins in different parts of your immune system and your body's uh, response to inflammation um, that are probably will help identify rejection, but exactly how those will fit into our detection toolkit remain to be seen. Um, there certainly is not anything that's perfect in terms of a blood test for screening for rejection right mm -hmm. yet. Um, we frequently get echoes. If someone tells us they're not feeling well, we'll get an echo cardiogram to look at how the heart's functioning and see if there's a decrease in function from the last time we looked. Mm -hmm. um, exercise testing seems to be uh, helpful sometimes for rejection, maybe more for coronary artery disease than for rejection. Um, but you know, there, there are a number of different approaches in terms of how to look for rejection that you need to treat. Um, and I think we're still learning how some of the new tests, the new blood tests that are coming online are gonna fit in with what we're already doing. But, but there are advances coming. Okay, um, we've got one that came in that's a two-part question here. Um, the first question, how hard is it to find a donor heart? And then another question, which probably just more food for thought, but why don't more people become donors? I don't know if you're familiar with any research around that, but we'll start with the first one. How hard is it for um, to find a donor heart for someone on the list? You want me to do that part? You do the second part? Sure. Okay. I may need a reminder of the second part yep. by the time I'm we get for there. You. That's fine. <laughs> um, it is a very hit and miss uh, Thing, finding a donor heart. The list, um, the list is something that is maintained by an organization called UNOS, the United Network for Organ Sharing. Um, and the goal of the list, uh, or basically a list of everybody who's being put up for an organ in the country in the United States, uh, the list is designed to match a heart best with a person who needs it most. So the sickest patients who have been on the longest get prioritized to the top of the waiting list for a heart. Um, and then we have to match a number of different things. We have to match size, we have to match blood type, um, we have to match any antibodies that a person is already making so we don't immediately put a heart into someone who's gonna reject it. Um, and we have to find a heart that actually fits that person the best. Sometimes we get offers within a day or two of listing. Sometimes people wait for months and months and months. Uh, and it really, I, there's nothing more I can say than sometimes it just comes down to luck and whether somebody or some family is donating a heart that matches at the same time someone needs it. And One thing we've done for infant hearts, um, for our infants mm -hmm. who are waiting for transplant, 
is um, we do something called ABO incompatible hearts. And so we can take um, a heart from a baby who has a different blood type than the recipient baby and we can successfully transplant the, the organ into the other baby and those babies do quite well. Um, they will need frequent follow-up to make sure that they're not developing antibodies against um, the blood type of the donor organ. Um, but that is one way that this, um, the Society of Transplant has tried to open up the donor pool, meaning the catchment for where we can get organs mm -hmm. from. Um, as far as how do we have more people sign up to be donors, um, that's a very interesting field. It's very difficult. It's interesting if you look at the evidence for over time, the, the number of people who are waiting for hearts is much greater than the people who are donating and the the amount of people who have donated over time has remained the same however the people waiting for organs has gone up so there's a lot of work with uh or within UNOS the United Network of Organ Sharing in Michigan um our procurement and our organ donor coalitions are doing a lot of work on trying to get the word out and having people register more. There's also debate, and I think it's still under debate under, or as regards to, is it automatic for someone to donate organs when they pass away, or is it a choice? Um, and that's definitely something that is being looked at, and I don't know if that will ever be um, decided, honestly. Yeah, there's certainly, there are some states that have gone, there's sort of an, whether you opt in to being transplant but the mm -hmm. or to being an organ donor, but the default is I'm not going to be an organ donor until I tell somebody that I want to be. There are some states that have changed to I am, the default is you are going to be an organ donor unless you actively tell somebody you don't want to be an organ donor. Mm -hmm. uh, and those states have better donation rates. Uh, Michigan is not one of those states yet. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if we will be or not. That's a lot of personal rights issues and more politics than I think we're going to get into. Mm -hmm. But why somebody doesn't be why why somebody would not be an organ donor? I think it's probably just a lack of education on exactly what it means. Mm -hmm. um, I think people don't understand the burden and the lack of adequate donors, the lack of enough donors. I think people probably have misinformation about what happens to you when you donate an organ or whether somebody's going to take an organ from you before you're dead, none of those things are going to happen. Um, so I, I think that the most important thing to do is to raise education in terms of what it means to be an organ donor. The single biggest increase in organ donors ever was when Facebook actually partnered with UNOS for a couple of days to raise an organ donation awareness. And there was a huge increase in people registering to be donors for that brief period of time. Just because people saw it, it got into their face and they became aware of, of the fact that, oh, I, I should be an organ donor. And they thought about it just for a short amount of time and it changed. So I, I think if you are interested in organ donation like we're interested in, in increasing donations, just tell people about it and talk to people about it. Have the conversation mm -hmm. because you may end up talking to somebody who one day will donate an organ. Another question that has come in through our email account, um, do multiple previous blood transfusions have an effect on transplantation rejection? Yeah, good question. That's a great question. Um, multiple pre previous blood transfusions can cause your body to make those antibodies that we were talking about to things that are foreign. Um, and they may you may start making antibodies against other human tissue. So we actually do a test, it's called a PRA. If you ever deal with transplant people, you'll hear that word. But it's it's a measurement of what percentage of the population you're going to make antibodies to. Blood transfusions are one of the things that can cause your body to sensitize, to, to see foreign tissue and start making antibodies. Um, it's one of the things we talk about a lot. It's one of the things we work towards, treating a lot. Um, Multiple blood transfusions certainly don't mean that you necessarily are going to make antibodies. It doesn't mean that even if you are making antibodies that you're going to have rejection. But it, it is one of the things that probably increases your risk of rejection at some point. Mm -hmm. 
We touched on this a little bit, but just to kind of get directly to this question, how long is the average wait for um, for someone who's waiting for a heart on the transplant list? That's changed over time as well. It has. Uh, I'd say right now it's months, uh, probably four to six months for the highest priority patients. Mm -hmm. Again, this this like survival, like many other things in transplant, varies based on how big a patient is, so that it's going to be different for an infant to a, an adolescent or a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, infants and small school age children, preschool children, are going to tend to wait longer because mm -hmm. there are less of those people who. Uh, there are less donors in that age group. There are less of those people who are dying. Mm -hmm. um, adolescents prone to taking more risks and young adults prone to taking more risks actually are more likely to be donors. So the waiting list for adolescents is, is generally shorter, but we've been telling everybody probably four to six months as a high priority status and longer than that if you're not in the top priority status. And I think that this question has not been raised. Um, however, what you were just talking about goes along to some of the guilt that recipient families have. They feel like they're waiting for someone to die um, mm -hmm. or that someone must die in order for their child to be saved. Something I think that's really important to um, think about when and if you ever need to go down this path as a family member or as a child, that the event of someone dying is going to happen anyway. The decision to become a donor happens after that event. It may be thought about a lot before the event. However, the event um, is not because your child or you need an organ transplant. And I think that's something that's very important when thinking about organ donation um, and being recipient families. Um, you had mentioned in part of your answer um, the you know, the different statuses of people on the wait list. We got a question in here about how does the donation registry work and can you talk to a little bit about the priorities assigned to the groups? Sure. Um, there are, so the donation registry, essentially there's a central organ governing body that takes, uh, maintains everybody whose doctors and nurses have put them up for transplant said we would we were taking offers for organs to take a transplant. They have a list of everybody in the United States whose doctors have said they need an organ transplant. Um, whenever somebody has an accident or has something, an illness that causes them to die or become brain dead um, and their previous wishes or their family wishes to donate organs, that those people's doctors then call, you know, call Gift of Life who talks with the the organ sharing organization and they say, figure out whether that person can donate organs and will facilitate how to uh, how that person actually is going to donate their organs um, then you know so will actually look at the list that they maintain to mm -hmm. try and get them to the sickest group of patients so a number of things go into this one is how sick are you? So there's a number of different statuses on the list. The highest priority status is something called 1A. Usually that means you're on a ventilator. Um, so a breathing tube is down, you're being supported by a ventilator. You're on uh, continuous IV infusion of medications to support your blood pressure and your heart function. Or for kids, you're on a ventricular assist device. Mm -hmm. um, status 1B is not quite the highest priority status, but it's close to it. That is somebody who is usually on a low amount of a continuous IV infusion, or there's a couple of other criteria that go into it. Mm -hmm. And then step two is your doctors would take a, a good heart for you if it was offered, but you are living at home. You're not on any continuous sort of invasive support mm -hmm. to support your heart and lungs as you're going along. So those are different statuses. Mm -hmm. Then you know, so we'll try and find the person who is the sickest that this heart, who has been the sickest for the longest amount of time, whatever organ the heart that's being donated matches. So they'll look at the blood types and the size and make sure that it fits all the criteria mm -hmm. to go into that patient so that it'll be a good match. And then they find the person in the country who has been at the highest priority for the longest period of time on the wait list um, and then we'll offer to that center. That center will then say, yes, that looks sounds like a good match. We like how that heart sounds. They'll get a lot of information about the donor and about how the donor heart looks and how it functions. 
uh, and then that center will decide whether or not to take it. And if they say no, then the UNOS will offer it to the next highest priority person. And we'll go down the list um, until somebody accepts the heart. Now, a related question that just came in, are there any geographic limitations to donor matching? That's a great question that I actually didn't touch on. Um, yes, but they're, <laughs> not, they're not huge. Um, we know that a heart can make it outside of the body um, for approximately before hours, for approximately four hours until the risk of that heart being sick after it gets transplanted goes up. Now there's a number of centers who have transplanted up to eight, nine, ten hours, and those hearts have done fine. But overall, we have a cutoff of about four hours is going to be as long as we can get it now. So that means your surgeons who go out to pick up a heart that's being donated basically have four hours to get back to wherever you your transplant is happening so for us Ann Arbor but not the surgeon who's doing the heart transplant surgery right. itself so there'll be so, another surgeon waiting in Ann Arbor mm -hmm. in the operating room getting their patient ready to take the transplant mm -hmm. um, and they won't cut out that person's old heart until the new heart is in the room Correct. but then once the heart gets to the room you take the old heart in, out put the new heart in sew it up straightforward um, <laughs> simple but that all has to happen about a four-hour time span. It doesn't sound like a lot, but we've certainly been able to get you know over as far as the Rocky Mountains out west and go mm -hmm. all the way to Florida or uh, I think we've gone to New Hampshire mm -hmm. on the East Coast. So we span most of the country in terms of where we're able to pull from, and most centers will do that. And if you ignore the four-hour rule, which some centers do, you can cover the entire country. Um, so there is some geographic limitations, but they're not huge. And I think it's also important to note that the organs are attempted to be placed locally and regionally first um, before they're offered at a bigger catchment. And that is because of the, the window and the complications that um, can potentially occur over that four hour window. And interesting, as long as we're talking about it, a couple of our colleagues in the Ken General Heart Center at Mott, um, Gay Bowens and Martin Box, are actually doing research on how to support heart outside of the body for a long period of time. So mm -hmm. Michigan has a long history of, of a machine called ECMO, uh, which is a, an artificial heart-lung device that can, can support, uh, is used to support people whose heart and lungs are failing. But you could theoretically just hook one of these hearts after it gets taken out of the body up to one of these devices too. Uh, and could circulate blood through it so that the heart is getting a good blood supply and that would potentially allow hearts to live outside the body for a long, longer period of time. There are other companies who are, who are working on similar devices to support the heart and these things are actually coming along. So it may be that in the near future, uh, the regionality of being able to select hearts and the limitation on how long a heart can be outside the body will go away because we'll have ways to support the heart better. Right now, the standard is some chemicals are given to the heart to protect it when it's without oxygenation. When it's without oxygen, then essentially goes into a cooler on ice mm -hmm. to keep it as fresh as possible. Uh, we have a question that was submitted on our Facebook page. Does the diagnosis of cerebral palsy get counted as a factor when deciding if a child qualifies for a transplant? And is the severity of the CP um, considered also? Um, that's a really good question. At our center, no, uh, and I think in most centers, no. It, it, I just got back from a, from a transplant conference, and actually this was a point of discussion, and actually has been for a couple of years, um, is how much somebody's functional status should play into um, whether a heart transplant is offered or not. That's mm -hmm. a really ethically loaded question and it something is. we think about a lot. And it's very difficult to determine someone's quality of life. Um, that's a very subjective question um, and something that we on our transplant team discuss often. But our, our really I think what our line is right now is uh, it's not for us to determine quality of life. Mm -hmm. um, I think there probably are thresholds if someone is just in a vegetative state uh, that probably is not somebody who who necessarily we would consider for a heart transplantation. But other than that, um, 
degrees of other types of disabilities are really not for us to determine whether or not that person right. would benefit or not benefit from a quality of life perspective. Mm -hmm. If it prolongs their life and that life is valued by the person or the family, we can offer transplant. That's, mm -hmm. That is really the stance that we're taking. And I think that's more and more of the stance that centers around the country are taking too. Mm -hmm. So to answer that question, it would certainly be talked about. I don't think it would come into the to the decision making in the end. It's definitely not but an it absolute be, contraindication. To certainly, it would be something we would talk about with with you or your family, mm -hmm. in terms of what we think this means in terms of progression of cerebral palsy or what life could be like afterwards. But I don't. Mm -hmm. I, it wouldn't. It wouldn't affect our saying yes or no to transplant. Mm -hmm. We would just want to make sure you understand what it means in terms of the CP and the rest of the life afterwards. Mm -hmm. A question um, regarding the transplant medications. Um, what are the risks caused by transplant medications and is there any progress with improving the medications for rejection? That's a good question. Um, Tacrolimus is our, what I call, our major number one big gun anti-rejection medication right now. Um, it is one of the most powerful immunosuppressants that we use for our kids, and it's one of our first line anti-rejection medications that we use. And it's typically the one that the children are on for the longest period of time. Um, the major side effect to tacrolimus, as I have referenced a little bit earlier in this talk is the effect it can have on the kidneys. And over time, tacrolimus um, is quite harmful and can be toxic to the kidneys. So um, there are advancements being made. Um, but before I get into that, there are also some other side effects to the medications and especially early on post-transplant, when you use tacrolimus or tacro, if you use steroids together, um, especially with the higher doses that you need to use initially post-transplant, you can induce something called post-transplant diabetes, um, where there's difficulty with insulin um, and blood sugars um, to the point where some kids need to be on um, insulin for a period of time until the level of steroids can go down and the tacrolimus levels can also go down. Um, some other side effects, um, you have to be careful when you are out in the elements, out in the sun. Um, some of the medications, um, because they suppress your immune system, it's important to watch out and wear sunscreen um, as far as sun exposure and your increased risk for certain types of cancer, which we have a phrase that we use. It's called post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. Um, those are the major side effects. There's um, some side effects can happen if your tacrolimus levels are too high. Um, some kids, you, you can have a lower seizure threshold, um, things like that. And obviously, if you are suppressing the immune system, you are most notably at increased risk for infections. And sometimes you are at more increased risk for opportunistic infections that not the general population is not at risk for. Are there others that you can think of as well? Um, there's a lot of side effects that go <laughs> along with the medications we yeah. use. But we always try and, and maintain levels of medication that are going to cause the smallest amount of side effects possible. Um, while still getting the benefit therapeutically, the, the stopping rejection that we want them to have. Mm -hmm. As far as advances, um, we have learned recently in pediatric transplantation that we can be without steroids, which have traditionally been a big part of our immune suppression mm -hmm. and probably the one that caused the most uh, side effects. Mm -hmm. We can take those away very quickly after transplant. Um, there are centers that are now practicing things called steroid avoidance, which is really extremely limited amounts of steroids given after transplant to suppress the immune system, and those patients are doing quite well. Mm -hmm. At our center, we're also tapering off of steroids very rapidly after transplant, much more rapidly than we used to, mm -hmm. um, and we've been successful with that. There are other immune suppression medicines that we use regularly. There's a new, relatively new class of medicines. Um, which uh, Sirolimus and Everolimus are the names of the new ones that we have been starting to use more and more. Mm -hmm. um, these are medications that can help decrease the toxicity of tacrolimus um, in terms of causing kidney disease while at the same time 
maintaining a good amount of immune suppression. And they may be helpful in startup in, in, in preventing coronary disease from occurring too. Mm -hmm. So there are medicines that we're starting to use more and more. Um, there are always new medications being researched, but right now those are the medicines that we're using. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, I'm always hopeful that new things will come online that will show us, uh, but there's nothing immediately in the pipeline that will be coming out. But I think with our new understanding of how the different medicines work together mm -hmm. and the latest generation of the new anti-transplant rejections, we're getting a lot better at, at managing the side effects and, and making sure things go well after transplant. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to take one last question here before we wrap up. Um, <clears throat> are the chances of a transplant lasting longer better if they are if the transplants received as an adult versus a child? You can take this one. Uh, no, it's actually the chances of a transplant lasting longer are better if received as a child compared to an adult. Mm -hmm. uh, pediatric survival rates actually significantly exceed adult survival rates. Um, so, yeah, the children tend to do better. Um, mm -hmm. That makes us happy because we tend to work with children. However, we also work with a lot of adults who have had congenital heart disease and are our patients because they have structural heart disease that pediatric cardiologists are going to understand more. It's certainly our goal to have those people's survival equal to that of our, our young children who get heart transplants. Mm -hmm. um, so we're working in that direction. But but overall survival is better for pediatric patients than it is for adult patients long term. You know, we do actually have one more that came in um, that I wanted to make sure we didn't miss here. And it actually is related to this. Um, it's a question from an individual with a VSD and an ASD um, on the left side. And um, to avoid sharing too much of this person's um, personal information, I'm, I'm going to leave some of their personal symptoms out, but her question is, why is she getting worse with age? Um, it seems like her symptoms rule her life, um, and so it seems as though she's asking why is this getting more complicated for her as she's aging? It's really hard to answer that question without, without knowing more about exactly what's going on um, and knowing more about the actual congenital heart disease that you have and how it's affecting your heart. Um, I would stress that if you're not, as you're getting older, uh, I don't know who your cardiologist is. It sounds like you need to see somebody who is trained in pediatric cardiology. There's a whole class of, of pediatric cardiologists who are called adult congenital heart, uh, cardiologists who are trained to talk with people who, and treat people who are older but have structural heart disease. Um, I would stress if you aren't seeing somebody like that already, um, please talk to whoever your cardiologist is and, and potentially see somebody who is trained in pediatric and congenital heart disease. Um, otherwise, I'm sorry that your symptoms are bad. I hope they get better and I think you should really ask the people who know your heart best why this is happening because there may be something they can help with. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank our panelists for their time today. We've had a lot of really great, great questions coming in um, to the point that Dr. Schumacher ended with. Um, we'd like to welcome anyone to visit our site for more information about the Congenital Heart Center here at CS Mott Children's Hospital. Our website is mottchildren.org slash congenital, um, or you can Google us, the CS Mott Children's Hospital Congenital Heart Center. <clears throat> You can also call, call our toll-free number. It's 877-475-MOTT. That's 877-475-MOTT. And our patient care representatives will be able to work with you to find a MOT specialist, um, both our pediatric heart specialists as well as our adult congenital heart physicians um, that see patients actually now at many locations throughout mm -hmm. Michigan. We're in Grand Rapids, Lansing, um, Traverse City, Petoskey, and several locations here in Southeast Michigan now, including our new Northville Health Center. So if you give us a call or check our website, you hopefully we'll be able to find a, a spot that will be convenient for you and your family. Um, I want to let you remind you all that this website was recorded and will be available on our website immediately following the chat if you want to watch it again or share it with any friends. The website again is mottchildren.org slash webchats. <clears throat> we want to invite you to take a brief survey to let us know if today's chat was helpful and share any recommendations with us that you'd have for topics for future webchats. 
We will be emailing that survey out to folks who are registered for the chat, as well as posting it on our social media channels. But if you just dropped in, you can also find that at umhealth.me slash aprilmotchat. Um, so, and then for anyone who is interested, our next scheduled um, talk with Mott web chat is next Thursday. That's April 30th at 12 p.m. And the topic next week is springtime asthma triggers and other asthma FAQs. So if you, um, if you have a family member with asthma, it sounds like it's going to be a great chat. And we welcome you to join us. Again, more information about that chat at mottchildren.org slash webchats. Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful afternoon.